I'm John Heilman. And I'm Mark Halpern. And with all due respect to my bracket, ah, uh, I totally had <laughs> Webb versus Gilmore in the finals. Happy St. Pat's and top of the evening to all y'all from Houston, Texas. On the show tonight, Judge Garland seeks the green light, the green that's been on ads, and Graham thinks the grass is greener on Cruz's side. But first, what's black and white and red all over? This New York Times story that hit the interweb during the day, we'll talk about it, as the presidential nomination fights uh, in both parties head into spring, the lagging candidates are getting more and more pressure to exit. We're going to talk about Cruz v. Kasich in a moment, but first, the gray lady is reporting that President Obama told a group of donors in Texas last week that Bernie Sanders is nearing the end of his White House bid, and he said that the party should soon unite behind Hillary Clinton. That's what the Times reported. At the White House today, Press Secretary Josh Earnest disputed the report, claiming the president was not taking sides in the Democratic nomination fight and was only making a case for party unity before November's general election. John, will these reported remarks by the president, even though they're being denied to some extent by the White House, accelerate efforts to get Sanders out of the race? Well, let's first start. The, the, the even earnest d d disputing of the of the report is not categorical. Let's be clear. President Obama <laughs> could say what he's reported to have said without taking sides. He could say uh, Bernie Sanders' time is coming to an end and it's time for the party to unify without taking sides officially. So, you know, do I think that Barack Obama can read the delegate math and read the delegate totals as well as anybody I do? Do I think Barack Obama uh, recognizes what most people recognize, which is that Bernie Sanders is not very unlikely to be the Democratic nominee? I do, too. And does he think that the party needs to unify in order to, to, to keep a Republican from succeeding him? And in particular, Donald Trump? I think I do, too. So I believe Obama probably said something close to this, and I think it is the case that a lot more Democrats, whether because of Obama or because of anything else, a lot more Democrats are going to start saying the same thing soon. Yeah, I think the Clinton people intended to be, be wait a little bit more to start this drumbeat, but they've started it in part because of her huge success on Tuesday and in part because Donald Trump looks like he may be cruising to the nomination. They do not want a Democratic fight that goes through June if Trump has got this thing sewn up faster than that. And I think President Obama is both reflecting that reality and whether he meant it or not will now drive it. Right. President Obama and, 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 and the Clintons have one thing in common, which is they both understand the value of money in politics and how important it is to have a lot of it in order to win tough races. <laughs> and uh, Hillary Clinton does not want to spend money uh, beating someone she's already basically beaten, Bernie Sanders, when she could be saving that money to take on someone who's going to give her a really hard fight, whether that's Donald Trump or somebody else. Iron rule of politics. Say something at a Texas fundraiser. Even if it's it'll closed press, <laughs> yeah. it'll get out. And the yeah, president knows that iron rule. <laughs> yes, he's not, not a dumb man. All right, now for some important updates in the Republican race. Ted Cruz's team is arguing for the last couple days, actually, that John Kasich is so far behind in delegates that he's waging an absurd, destructive, and quixotic campaign for the Republican nomination. And two of Kasich's former rivals and Cruz's former rivals seem to agree. Remember that fellow Marco Rubio? He returned to his Capitol Hill office today to something he probably wished he'd gotten on Tuesday, a standing ovation. A couple of weeks ago, of course, Rubio was calling Cruz a liar. But last night, according to a Minnesota newspaper, Rubio told supporters in that state that Cruz was, quote, the only conservative left in this race. Now let's talk about an even bigger U-turn. You might recall that South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham said this about Ted Cruz just about a month ago. If you kill Ted Cruz on the floor of the Senate and the trial was in the Senate, nobody could convict you. <laughs> uh, that might leave you thinking uh, about the, that the day that Senator Graham would support Senator Cruz it would be the day that pigs started to fly. And apparently, the pig flying day is upon us. Bottom of the hour, Fox News alert. Pigs are flying, actually, today because... Lindsey Graham is supporting Ted Cruz for president. Yep. That is correct. Lindsey Graham, the Lindsey Graham, is hosting a fundraiser for Ted Cruz, the Ted Cruz, on Monday. And Graham says that in order to stop Donald Trump, he will help Cruz, quote, in every way I can, end quote. So, Mark, my question for you, why are Rubio and Graham siding with Cruz over Kasich? And what effect might it have on the race? 
Well, look, Lindsey Graham has thought for a while that John Kasich would just not have enough strength to stop or even slow down Donald Trump appreciably. He looks at the map, he looks at the money, he looks at the message, and he believes that a more conservative person, which Cruz is than compared to Trump in many ways, is the only way to stop him from getting a majority of delegates and then stopping him at the convention. So it is not some newfound love or even appreciation for Ted Cruz. It is simply the cold, hard reality from Graham's point of view that Cruz is the only vehicle to stop Donald Trump from being the nominee. In the case of Marco Rubio, I think, uh, you know, John Kasich does have some positions that are more moderate. And I think some people in the party, conservative activists and others, are saying basically we want a conservative nominee, and that leaves us one choice at this point, which is Ted Cruz, even though John Kasich I, I, is conservative in a lot of ways. Sure. I agree with everything you said there, uh, but I'll add one additional layer to the analysis, which is that both these guys are United States senators, and Ted Cruz is also a United States senator, much though he sometimes pretends like he's not. Um, that the fact that senators are sticking together, uh, not surprising. Um, the fact that more governors have not rallied to John Kasich is the thing that's surprising. But I'm not surprised to see a couple guys who are members, along with Ted Cruz, of the world's so-called greatest deliberative body are uh, backing their friend against a governor of Ohio. Yeah, you know, this group of conservative activists who met in Washington and by phone today uh, thinking about getting a third candidate in the race. I think Ted Cruz, he's picked up some conservative endorsements, and this, yeah. and this thing from Graham is helpful. But it'd be interesting yeah. to see if he can build momentum. Now that you don't have election contests uh, every week and big contests, it's going to be hard for either Cruz or Kasich, I think, to build up the kind of momentum they need to really become the decisive alternative. Yeah, we should right. probably As say, even though the bell even though the bell went off, Mark, we should probably say that John Kasich did get the endorsement of Mike Levitt today, the former governor of Utah. So that's worth yep. saying. And he's he's picking up support along the way, but Cruz had a better day on that front. All right. No doubt. As previewed on Tuesday night, John Kasich started going after Donald Trump a little bit more aggressively today than he has. In response to that comment that Trump made about how he thinks the grassroots would respond if the party tries to wrestle the nomination away from him in Cleveland, Kasich tweeted this quote, Donald Trump said there could be riots if he's denied the GOP nom in a contested convention. That's more unacceptable language. And also from Kasich, this tweet, quote, this implicit acceptance of violence is the kind of rhetoric that's pulling people apart. In the case of a chaotic convention, one name that continues to be floated as a possible white knight by a lot of party leaders is the House Speaker Paul Ryan, who is the guy who will be behind the podium chairing the convention's entire delegate voting process in the convention overall. Here's what Ryan said today when he was asked for the upteenth time about whether he would accept his party's nomination if the convention ends up deadlocked after multiple ballots. It's not going to be me. It should be somebody running for president. Look, I made a decision over a year ago not to run for president. I really believe if you want to be president, you should run for president. People are out there campaigning, they're canvassing, there's caucuses and primaries. That's who we should select from among for our next president on whatever ballot we're talking about. So let's just put this thing to rest and move on. I had six days notice taking this job. I learned after becoming speaker that I'm the chair of the convention. Um, so I will have to obviously uh, bone up on all the rules and the, all of those things. My goal is to be dispassionate and to be Switzerland, to be neutral and dispassionate and to make sure that the rule of law prevails and to make sure that the delegates uh, make their decision um, however the rules require them to do that. So John Ryan's demurring, obviously, although, as many people have pointed out, he demurred about being speaker, too. Oh, yeah. What effect does the fact that he is in charge of the convention have on the possibility that he could be the white knight at a contested convention? Uh, well, it creates certain complications, which I'm going to bet that you are going to probably outline in a minute. But I'll just say it also creates certain real advantages. I mean, look, he will be in a position where he can maintain neutrality up until the last possible moment. He would be if, if, a, knight, if a white knight's going to come in, he's going to have to be drafted and drafting somebody in from a position of neutrality is the right way to get that done. And as you point out and as Ryan points out, he's running this show and becoming the eventual nominee in a contested convention requires knowledge of the inside game. Ryan will understand this inside game better than anyone when we get to Cleveland. Yeah, look, it makes it in some ways more likely, in some ways less. I sound balanced. It makes it less only because he'll be so enmeshed in running the thing that the yeah. symbolism of it, you know, the hardest thing about a white knight coming in from the point of view of those who don't want Trump to be the nominee is the symbolism. And the yep. added symbolism of the guy who's in charge 
you know, I won't, I won't say it's exactly like this, but it's kind of like when Dick Cheney picked himself to be Bush's running mate. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the fix would look like it was in even more if the guy in charge of the convention says, oh, by the way, I'm taking this thing. Makes it harder, I think, although you pointed out some of the ways it might make it easier. Well, look, it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be ugly if it happens one way or the other. I'm not sure this makes it that much uglier. Anyway, when we come back, why Hillary Clinton is laughing at Donald Trump in a new web video after this. Yesterday, you may recall, we showed you a new web video that Donald Trump tweeted out showing Hillary Clinton barking like a dog and Vladimir Putin chortling, presumably at her. Well, today, a super PAC supporting Clinton, Priorities USA, turned the tables on the Donald. Who are you consulting with consistently so that you're ready on day one? I'm speaking with myself, number one, because I have a very good brain and I've said a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, um, uh, whatever you think of that is an aesthetic uh, on aesthetic merits. Uh, what does it tell you about how Team Clinton is thinking about what it has to do when Donald Trump goes on offense? My sense is that they looked at that web video that Trump put out yesterday and didn't treat it like some trifle that they saw both in its, in its cutting nature and in the implications of its viral quality, and it did get played a lot on cable and, and bounced around the web, that they decided they had to be now, and I predict they'll be in this mode the rest of the way. They have to be in the mode of, he brings a knife, you bring a gun. He brings a gun, you bring a bazooka. Because they cannot let Trump do to her what he's done to most of his Republican opponents. Right. This is just an, an updated, modern-day version of something you're really familiar with that was known back in 1992 as the War Room, to the point where it's now become kind of commonplace, that you respond to everything always, don't let anything uh, that, that's in any way negative about your candidate go unchallenged or unretorted or unreplied to. I think they have learned not just from that thing yesterday, not just that web video, but from previous tangles with Trump, that they, want to, that they, they can't afford to let, him, let those go unanswered. And also they want to throw a big, big elbow at Trump and say, hey, you know what, we're not going to be passive here. You should know there's going to be a price to pay if you come after us unprovoked. Yeah, they also have to get to the point where they can succeed, where these other anti-Trump efforts have failed on the Republican side, which is they have to be able to, if, if they're going to do, if they're going to you know, do well, they have to be able to effectively mock him. Trump right. is so good at mocking others. They've got to get to the point. And of course, part of the, the, one of the biggest areas of incredulity that people have who've tried to take down Trump is, from their point of view, Trump is the most easily mocked person in yeah. politics. And no one and does it well. they have to be able to mock him in a way no to, one does to it make well. it effective. Yeah, yeah. Right. All right. The possibility of a general election matchup between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump is one of many factors that is now hovering over the Capitol Hill fight about whether President Obama's pick for the Supreme Court will get a hearing. While Republican leaders haven't changed their position about whether there will be a hearing, there are a few GOP senators, such as Jeff Flake of Arizona, who have agreed to meet with the nominee, Merrick Garland. They've noted that the party is taking a gamble by blocking Garland since the outcome of the general election in November is totally unknown. If uh, Republicans are not successful in the November election, I hope we are, but if we're not, uh, then we ought to look at this nomination in a lame duck session in November. Um, I would rather have a less liberal nominee uh, like Merrick Garland uh, than a nominee that Hillary Clinton, if she were president, would put forward. So that is one point of view on the Republican side, not necessarily a majority. Today, Patrick Leahy, the Democrat from Vermont, longtime Senate Judiciary Committee member, former chair of the committee, called for his colleagues to vote on Garland by Memorial Day. And an army of Republican and Democratic senators have been all over cable news for the past 24 hours, towing the party line. John, at this moment, with all the back and forth there has been since we last spoke about this, yeah. which side is winning? the SCOTUS tug of war over Garland. 
White House, Democrats, Democrats in the White House are winning right now because right now the media is with the, with, with the White House. I think rightly so, that we we're all saying that you know, the Senate should do its job. But you're hearing that even from some quarters of conservative media saying, look, you guys, you're, you are, you're killing yourselves here. This is the kind of thing that has done damage to the Republican brand in the past by seemingly to be mindlessly intransigent. Um, to, to not take a meeting with the guy, to not give the guy a hearing. If you want to shoot him down, shoot him down. But give him those things just to make it look like you're willing to at least do your jobs. Yep. Look, Democrats, in politics, you know, the side is winning is where they're saying the same thing publicly and privately. Democrats right. in public are saying we're going to win this, and totally. privately they're, they like the way things are going. It's easy to find Republican strategists who say the mistake was to come out early the way we did. We're not winning this fight. They think possibly they can hold the line. No hearing, keep the base happy, and not pay a big price. But some of them are worried about paying a price when public opinion is still fluid, but look, Democrats often have the media on their side because of liberal bias. This is a case where the media is, believes the Democrats are doing the right thing, and I think over time, if the White House continues to perform this way, public opinion is gonna shift in a way that is gonna spook the Republicans. Right, and that Jeff Flake thing, I think he's giving voice to something that a lot of people are thinking, and it's not a position of strength they're gonna be in trying to negotiate some crazy, oh, we'll take it up in a lame duck session thing. That is not the place where Republicans wanna be negotiating from if they expect to win. Anyway, coming up, Senator Amy Klobuchar joins us to talk more about that Supreme Court nomination battle after these words from our sponsors. Can you feel it? Merrick Mania sweeping the nation, well, part of the nation. We're joined now to talk about the Supreme Court nomination by Senator Amy Klobuchar, the Democrat from Minnesota, who sits on the Judiciary Committee. Senator, thanks for joining us from the hollowed well, ground of the Russell Rotunda. Oh, very nice. Well, you're in, where are you guys? Houston, Phoenix, wherever you are. But I am here. We're all, we're all around. Senator, I know you've got an open mind about this nomination, and Republicans, uh, in some ways, we talked about last block, maybe made a mistake by saying they don't. I'm wondering what decisions uh, the judge has, has uh, signed that concern you that you want to ask him about. Well, I'm actually just starting to look at his record. Obviously, no one knew he was the pick until yesterday. Uh, but what I do know as a former prosecutor myself is that's not an easy job. And he oversaw two of the most high profile, difficult criminal cases of our time. And that's the Unabomber and the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, he also has an incredibly strong rec reputation as a judge. I know in the criminal area he's tended to um, uh, be a little more conservative than some of his liberal colleagues on some of the cases. I think there's about 10 different cases like that. Uh, so obviously uh, that of someone who's a prosecutor, um, I can understand that and I want to look at what those cases are as well as the rest of his record. But I think the main point here today is as you noted earlier uh, that there are some Republican senators now. Senator Collins actually said she was going to do her job and meet with him. Uh, Senator Flake and five or six of them have agreed to meet with him. And today I thought Angus King said it best for the ones that haven't yet agreed to meet with him. Are you just afraid you'll like him too much? Uh, you know, he is so, a good so, guy uh, with a great background. Senator I, know, Senator, I know you like a lot about him, and I take your point that you're probably just now reading into his record and some of his decisions. But I'll just ask again for a brief question, brief answer. Are there any general areas that you know about how he's ruled, where you've got concerns that you want to hear more about. Not where you've liked what he's done, but where you've got concerns. Um, well, I, I, again, I, I literally found out about this yesterday uh, when we were in the Rose Garden or an hour before. So we're gathering his record, and I'll see what concerns I have. I've tended to, in the past, uh, with Sonia Sotomayor's hearing and Elena Kagan, uh, asked about uh, First Amendment case, a Sullivan case. I've asked about criminal cases because of my background as a prosecutor. Um, I want to look at uh, some of the uh, stance he's taken. I personally think we should have cameras in the Supreme Court because I know you guys would like to see things immediately. I'll ask him about that. Um, and right. so I have a lot of good questions to ask him. Senator, I, I know yesterday that Planned Parenthood, Cecile Richards, uh, came out with a, a statement that I would say is tepid in support of, uh, of Merrick Garland, um, not, not enthusiastic. And, and, and she acknowledged that there were a lot of questions about, uh, open questions about his support for reproductive rights. Does, does that issue give you any pause from what you know about uh, Garland's record? 
again, I'd want to look at his positions if he's respected Roe v. Wade. But uh, for me, what's really important here is the fact uh, that he is someone that is known as being fair, uh, that he has had the respect of Democrats and Republicans. You look at some of the comments they've made in the past, the fact that he received the votes of Senator Hatch and Senator McCain uh, and Senator Collins, Senator Cochran, right. Senator Coates, Senator Roberts, Senator Inhofe, uh, people who have been around here a long time, uh, with Senator Hatch once saying, you know, I, I, I challenge anyone to come to say why he wouldn't be a good nominee. So I will look at the record, and I have not made a decision yet, like everyone else. I plan on meeting with him next week. Um, but I think what's important here is that we need to have a hearing to ask those questions. Yes, I will ask those questions at a private meeting. But my constituents have a right to know his answers. Senator, let me, let me just ask you a question on the politics of this. You know, there's a, there's a, lot, of, um, a, a lot of groups on the left who who look at this uh, choice and are not overly enthused. And, and there, it's not a, so much a matter of the merits, it's a matter of just a sense of, uh, of opportunity missed. Um, this is an overwhelmingly uh, male, white institution. Um, they were happy when Elena Kagan got on the court and Sonia Sotomayor, but still think there should be, there's room for another woman or maybe a woman of color. Do you think that President Obama played it a little bit too timidly here uh, by choosing a 63-year-old white man uh, to step up and fill Antonin Scalia's seat? Uh, I don't think President Obama played it timidly at all. I would not ever use that adjective to describe him. In fact, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would describe his actions in the last year where he's focusing on moving ahead on Cuba and many other things as being far from timid. Um, and um, what I think he's done here is pick the person that he thought was best for the job. Uh, twice, uh, Judge Garland was close up there uh, for these previous nominations. In one nomination, I uh, nominated Elena Kagan and the other Sonia Sotomayor, two women, one Hispanic, uh, and with being the first African-American president with a number of cabinet members of color, including the Attorney General of the United States, I don't think anyone can doubt the president's street creds on diversity. Senator, we've got about a minute left. I'm wondering, you know Iowa pretty well from a neighboring state. You've spent time there. What do you think would have to happen within Iowa politics, public opinion, to cause Senator Grassley to change his mind about whether there should be a hearing or not? Well, I think that's going to be up to Senator Grassley. I've worked with him on a number of issues. We have some major bills on uh, a pay for delay with pharmaceutical companies, um, and I've had a good working relationship with him. Um, and I hope that he will be listening to his constituents. I know that, I don't know what the numbers show in Iowa, but Iowa's tended to have an open court system. Speaking of cameras in the courtroom, they've had cameras in their Supreme Court in Iowa. They tend to be transparent and open. The Des Moines Register has been really outspoken on this. And you look at nationally, as the president noted in the Rose Garden yesterday, two-thirds of the American people favor going forward with a hearing here. Now, Senator Grassley or any other senator do not have to vote for this nominee, uh, but I think they need to hear him out and let their constituents hear him out. This is a public servant that deserves it, and our country deserves this hearing. All right, Senator Amy Klobuchar, member of judiciary from Minnesota. How was that? Thank you. That was, oh, that was a All nice right. little accent, maybe closer to Fargo accent, but very good. All right, Senator, thank you. All <laughs> right, speaking of the Judiciary Committee, the committee's chairman, Charles Grassley, as we said, is getting challenged in his state over this issue, and he's being challenged for re-election by several Democrats, including the state's former Lieutenant Governor, Patty Judge. We'll talk to her about her race and about this issue, Senator Grassley, right after this. Joining us now from Des Moines is the former Lieutenant Governor of Iowa, his Democratic candidate vying to challenge Chuck Grassley for his Senate seat. Lieutenant Governor Patty Judge, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, Patty, I'm curious about, the, you, you have jumped on this, this Supreme Court issue pretty hard just in the last 24 hours. Just explain to me what you are doing right now, um, both as a matter of, of process and a matter of politics, to try to bring pressure on uh, Charles Grassley uh, to bring uh, Merrick Garland up for real consideration in the U.S. Senate? Well, sure. I, uh, I first started talking about this issue very uh, soon after Justice Scalia's death, when almost immediately Chuck Grassley uh, informed us that he was not going to hold any hearings, and uh, he has evidently not ever backed off of that position. Uh, I think that's the wrong approach, and that that is an obstructionist 
uh, way of handling government, and um, we deserve better. Uh, now, with the uh, with the uh, name uh, of uh, Garland put forth by the president yesterday, uh, I think uh, we should need to hear have a hearing and learn about this gentleman. I think that's um, Senator Grassley's job as the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and I hope he'll do that. Beyond the merits of, of the argument that you're making, what, would just talk to me a little bit about the politics and explain to me the theory of the case by which you think that this is an issue on which Senator Grassley could be politically vulnerable. Well, we, I believe he is vulnerable on this issue. You know, this, this election cycle, uh, we really have seen so much dissatisfaction with politics as usual and, and playing political games. I think uh, the voting public across this country and definitely here in Iowa is really fed up with that. We saw that in our caucuses and uh, we're seeing it now across the country. Uh, it is an issue that uh, people feel strongly about, whether it is, it, whether it is obstructing a, a hearing, whether it is uh, refusing to pass a budget, whatever uh, the issue, I think people expect that elected officials uh, do the job, uh, find a path to finding solutions and uh, and not just to fold their arms and say, no, we're not going to do it. Governor, with all due respect, you've won some races in Iowa. You've lost some. Uh, Chuck Grassley's won a lot. What makes you think, how can you make the claim that he's out of step or out of touch with what Iowans think about this issue, given his track record? Well, we've been watching uh, him over the last few months and uh, definitely believe that public opinion is not with him. I think this is a very, he's very vulnerable on this issue and uh, we intend to keep it uh, in front of the public. Uh, and uh, I think it is having a real effect on him. Uh, his answers are just not, uh, don't hold much water. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't see through that. You know, we pride ourselves in our politics and uh, uh, they people can see uh, a lot of double speak when they hear it. Do you predict he'll lose uh, the general election regardless of whether you're the nominee or not if he doesn't relent and hold a hearing? Well, you know, I think I'm the best candidate or I would not have gotten into the race. Uh, we know that it uh, takes uh, uh, someone with uh, some name identification and someone that uh, can seriously challenge him. Um, as you said, I've won a lot. I've lost a few. Um, I am a known person here in the state, just as Chuck Grassley is, and I think uh, this is going to be a good head-to-head -head contest. Uh, t t tell me, uh, J uh, Governor, what your, your sense is beyond this issue or the other areas in which you think that uh, Senator Grassley is vulnerable. He obviously has been in that office for a pretty long time now and has seemed to be as one, not just one, won a number of elections, but won some of them quite commandingly. So what is it, what are the other issues on which you think you would take the fight, Senator Grassley, if you're the nominee? Well, you know, we never know in an election how things will turn uh, from now until next fall, but I definitely believe that he's vulnerable on issues like protecting Social Security uh, affordable health care, affordable college, raising the minimum wage. These are all issues that uh, should be happening. Uh, he and the Republican leadership are stonewalling on them, and uh, uh, they are things that we need to make happen and, and soon after this next election. There's you know, just do a little political analysis for me of your state, which has become a state, obviously a battleground state at the presidential level, um, has gone blue the last couple cycles, uh, but has at this moment at least a, a Republican governor and two Republican senators. What, what's 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 the, the the current kind of state of, of Iowa's purpleness, as it were? Well, you know, Iowa's always kind of purple, um, and again, I think that's because we are so political with our first in the nation <clears throat> caucuses. People listen and study and talk, but uh, w as you said, we have gone blue for the last two cycles, and I believe uh, that that will uh, happen again this cycle in the presidential race, and, and I believe that we have a chance at uh, taking one of those Senate seats. All right. Uh, thank you, Patty Judge. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, coming up next, Mark Halperin, my friend, will give us a little glimpse into Ted Cruz's campaign across the country there at Houston. If you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can also listen to us on Bloomberg 99.1 FM.
And out here in Houston is Ted Cruz's chief spinmeister. I mean spokesperson. That's Alice Stort, pride of Little Rock, joining us here in Houston to talk about the man she works for now, Ted Cruz. Um, you guys are picking up some endorsements, that Rubio quasi endorsement and Lindsey Graham. Did, did Senator Graham and Ted Cruz talk, as far as you know, before he bestowed that endorsement? Well, there's been a lot of conversations with, uh, with a lot of different folks uh, throughout the last several, uh, couple weeks or so. And look, we're, we're thrilled to have uh, Sen Senator Graham uh, back us and host a fundraiser for us and show us support. And you know, we, we expect more to come. Of course, this morning, uh, Senator Rubio uh, saying that Ted Cruz is the only conservative in this race. That goes a long way, and we're seeing and sensing more and more of that. We had uh, Carly Fiorina uh, endorse us last week. She's been campaigning uh, across the country. And, and look, what, what we're seeing more and more, people recognize that Ted Cruz is the true consistent conservative, even those who have campaigned hard against him. They see him as someone who uh, is, is going to fight against Washington as usual. And clearly, based on the results of these elections, people are fed up with, with Washington. They want to see someone change. And whether they're currently in Washington or a Washington outsider, they want someone who will stand up and fight Washington. And they're, they're acknowledging that Ted Cruz is the person. We have wanna, to nominate someone to defeat Donald Trump. I want to ask you about two things of, of strategy that your campaign is involved in that some people are confused by, including me, and ask you to explain them. One is you competed in Florida. You competed in Ohio. It's great to compete everywhere. But Donald Trump won one state handily. Ted Cruz, uh, John Kasich won the other. Why compete in Arizona, a state by all indications, Donald Trump's way ahead. Do you think you're going to win Arizona? There's st a strategy uh, going on here, and and part of it is to is is to play in places where we can. Uh, but do you predict Ted Cruz will win Arizona? What we're we're looking to do well in all these states. Well, moving, doing moving well ahead. in Arizona look, doesn't help you. You got to win, or you get nothing. We're, what we're doing is look the the. Strategy up until now is to acquire as many delegates as we possibly can are you and win on the field. Win, and look, are you that, playing to our, win in Arizona? Our, our strategy is, that what, to, is that why he's going to Arizona? Our strategy to win on the field in right. Florida was successful, right. was it not? Are you, yes, are it was. Are you playing to win in Arizona? Or is that why you're going on television? Is that why the senator is going there? Or is something else going on? We're going on television in Arizona. We're also going on right, television you, in Utah trying, and several states. I'm going to move on. I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you trying to win Arizona? Is that what's happening? Our, our goal is to do as well as we possibly can in every state and to acquire as many delegates. And, and the good thing, moving forward with, yeah. the, with the map, the next 22 uh, primaries we have on the map, they are um, look good for us. 14 of them are closed primaries, which are, are more beneficial for Ted, right. given that it's Republicans going to the ballot box. Four of them are Republicans and independents, which are, are beneficial. There are four that are so-called Trump primaries that are open for Democrats, independents, and Republicans. So we're looking at the next 22 primaries are, are High, many of them are favorable to Ted. Close primaries when we have Republicans, hardcore conservatives right. coming out to the ballot box. And caucuses uh -oh. where you've done better. Another thing people are, are questioning is you all put out a memo on election night before all the results were known. And you're making claims about the ability to get a majority of the delegates or even to win more delegates than Donald Trump. And some people are saying that's kind of undermining your credibility in, in, in sort of convincing people that there's a path here. Is there actually still today, as we sit here, a path where Ted Cruz wins a majority of the delegates before the convention? I have the memo right here. Yeah. And, and yes, there, there's several paths to victory here. And they could be us winning the 1237 outright and um, t having this settled before, before we get to the convention. Well, let me stop you on that one, because that's what I'm asking about. Some people, have you heard from people saying, Alice, that has kind of strange credulity and makes it look like you guys actually don't have a path? Because you're claiming that that's a path. No, I said that, no look, one said I'm, that to you, but I'm, me. I'm, I'm saying there's there are several. Right, but people several, are saying that the, that one is not a path. That there are other paths. There, but that one isn't a path right now. There are there are several paths to a Ted Cruz victory, yeah. and that that being one of them. Yeah. Uh, the other is uh, acquiring as many delegates as we can, taking this to convention, and winning this outright on the on the convention floor. And we feel as when we get to convention, when there are more conservatives, more uh, committed, a long lifelong Republicans uh, deciding this, that Ted Cruz is going to walk away the winner. And th this what makes this election uh, so exciting. Of course, we got into this uh, not not knowing who would be 
in this spot at this stage of the game, uh, this time last year. And it's going to be an exciting, uh, it's been an exciting campaign, but uh, you know, there is there is a chance this will be decided at convention. But the key for our, our strategy moving forward, we've got uh, tremendous resources to execute our long-term strategy. We're going to continue to do what we've been doing, competing hard in these states where their delegates are awarded proportionally in order to continue to rack up delegates. And as I said, with the closed primaries on the horizon, they're beneficial to Ted, and, and we're looking forward to that. Senator Cruz uh, is, is emphasizing the border and immigration as he competes in must in, uh, in winner-take-all Arizona. Tell me what the difference from your point of view is between Ted Cruz and Donald Trump on the, what well, for Mr. Trump has been the signature issue of immigration. Well, one thing's for sure, Ted's not gonna be flexible on anything he says or does or executes when it comes to immigration. He will be in Arizona tomorrow. He'll be on the border touring the border with uh, a farm family uh, in uh, southern Arizona. They're going to be sharing with What's him. What's the difference between Cruz and Trump on immigration? Well, uh, one thing's for sure, Ted has uh, been committed to first and foremost securing the border as and not Donald, coming up Donald with, Trump? He's with some pie in the sky story about we're going to get Mexico to pay for the wall. That's that's not going to happen. Ted is, is providing practical solutions to the immigration problem, first and foremost, uh, securing, securing the border, ex uh, enforcing existing laws, and not not providing amnesty for uh, people here in this country illegally. So and, how and would you characterize, you characterize Trump's position on, on the people here illegally as amnesty? Well, so absolutely. And here's the thing, when we don't know what Donald Trump is going to uh, speak tomorrow. He's on both sides of virtually every issue and has acknowledged, he even acknowledged on, 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 on many news outlets that what he's talking, what he said, the, the New York Times, when he had the off the record conversation with the New York Times reporter, admitting that what he has been saying on the campaign trail with regard to immigration, uh, that he has no intention whatsoever of carrying that through if he were to be the nominee, that speaks volumes. Uh, and he has, uh, on many times, said whether whether he's taken both sides of the issue or said he would be flexible on it, or in this case, acknowledging to a reporter that what he's saying about immigration is simply campaign rhetoric, that should be uh, concerning. As we head to the Northeast, there are a bunch of Northeast contests left. Donald Trump's from the Northeast. John Kasich's profile is closer uh, in many ways to the kind of Republicans who win primaries in the Northeast. What are the arguments you would make to say that Ted Cruz can do well and win delegates in states like New Jersey, Connecticut, New York? Pennsylvania. Well, well, first of all, we're, we're going to continue to have momentum as we move through the, the next primary and caucus states. We're going to have the resources to execute a ground game, and that's that's critical. Our ground game is what uh, got us the victory in Iowa and what has uh, carried us through many of these states that, that we've uh, shown tremendous victories on and acquired delegates. We have a tremendous amount of resources, not just in terms of having raised uh, $72 million, but we have a, a strong field operation that we're executing to various states, and that's going to play a key in us winning in all areas of the country, whether it's the Northeast yep. or, or out West okay. as well. Alice Stort, thank you so much for thank Ted Cruz's campaign. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. March Adness after this. Joining us once again is our number cruncher in chief, Ken Goldstein, for a segment we've come to call fondly by the numbers. Tonight's topic is March Adness. <laughs> That's very punny. Ken, thanks for joining us from Washington. Um, I'd like you to talk, first of all, about a topic that you've referred to in terms of bracket busting. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the expectations about the kind of money that we're going to get spent on ads and what's actually happened. I have a feeling that maybe the expectations and the reality are somewhat different. Sure. Um, some had the number a bit higher, but it good consensus estimate of what political ad spending was going to be in 2016 was about $4.2 billion, about 75% on broadcast, 25% on cable. And again, some, some people had that number uh, even, even higher. To date, we've had a little under $370 million um, spent on political, uh, political advertising in the presidential race. And of that overall number, about one third of that, or even a little bit more than one third of that, should be on the presidential race. So the question is, is what we've seen so far, that 369 million, more or less than it should be if we were, uh, if we were on pace to meet those numbers? So on the one hand, it's a little bit more. So if you look back to 2008 or if you look back to 2012, that's way more money than was spent on, uh, on TV in those races. 
but there's a couple factors that show the pace slowing. So, first of all, the great majority of that spending was just in three states, uh, New Hampshire, Iowa, and South Carolina, and the pace has slowed after that. And the other point is, and this is especially the case on the Republican side, the majority spenders on the Republican side, uh, who spent over $75 million with uh, Right to Rise and over $50 million with Conservative Solution Project, were the super PACs of two candidates, Jeb Bush and Mark Rubio, who aren't in the race anymore. <laughs> so it seems higher, but there's some, there's some danger signs. And then, of course, there's the Trump effect. All right, Ken, let's talk about the Trump effect and what we like to call the unsweet 16. Trump obviously has gotten good ratings for TV, but he's not spent a lot for a, a big the Republican frontrunner on ads. If he is the nominee in the general election, what's the danger for these TV stations that tend to make a lot of money from political ads if Trump continues to rely on earned media and free media and not on paid media? As you said, TV executives love the high ratings that Trump generates, but they're very concerned about what, what Trump could do to that ultimate ad spend. He's only spent about $17 million himself on, on advertising, but the big danger for, uh, for, for some of these broadcasters who've begun to rely or who have become very reliant on political ad spending in even numbered years is the groups who, as we've talked about a bunch, pay three or four times as much as the candidates and spend, uh, you know, I don't know what the technical term is, a ton of money on political advertising, whether they sit out the presidential race. So that's a real possible, two real possible down factors. One, that Trump himself is not going to spend a lot. And two, that there's not going to be lots of Republican groups uh, coming to bat for Trump. On the other hand, I'll, I'll, I'll hedge a little bit here. If Trump changes how the 2016 elections look, that could increase spending in some other races. So maybe Trump makes some states competitive that weren't competitive before. That could draw ad spending in those states. Or what if Trump on the ticket makes some Senate races and some House races more competitive than we would have thought? And so all those super PACs and groups that would have spent big money for Republican in the presidential race now instead are spending that big money to defend House seats and to defend Senate seats. Ken, I'm a pretty big basketball fan, but you don't have to be a pretty big basketball fan to know that the worst thing that you can do on the court is an air ball. In fact, people say air ball, air ball during the games. You have come to the conclusion that the anti-Trump spending so far on the air is basically an air ball. Please explain. Well, you know, again, I, it's difficult to do this in real time, and it's always much more fun to be the couch coach than the real coach uh, and to uh, say how the shot should have gone in rather than screaming air ball, but I do think it was a bit of an air ball. Um, about $80 million has been spent against Donald Trump, which, when you measure that against all the free media that he's gotten, isn't a ton. But what's even more perplexing to me is over half the anti-Trump spending has happened after March 1st, after Super Tuesday. So they've done it when lots of the elections had already happened, when lots of the delegates had already been selected. Or even you look at a place like Florida where we recently had a primary, and a lot was made of the $8 million that was spent in the last week against Donald Trump. Well, one, $8 million isn't really a lot of money, and two, almost 50% of Florida Republican voters voted early. So all of that money was spent when half the Florida Republican primary electorate had already voted. And then recently we have, we have, uh, we have an ad um, that was out that has um, women reading, um, reading uh, quotes, inflammatory quotes from Donald Trump. And it's a 60 second ad um, and it seems pretty powerful but it started airing on this past Tuesday, March 15th, after not only Super Tuesday was done, but after Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio, yeah. and Illinois, and Missouri yeah. um, were, were done, which is uh, a bit perplexing. Right, so it's not only an air ball, Ken, it's an air ball that came after the buzzer. Not so great. Okay, thanks to Ken Goldstein for uh, that great segment. Up next, what Elizabeth Warren will not say, and also, who won the day after this? Houston, Houston, who won the day? 
Ted Cruz, the Rubio, and Graham endorsements are a big deal. I agree with you 100%, Ted Cruz. All right, you know who could have won the day? CBS This Morning, if they just played their interview with Senator Elizabeth Warren a little bit differently. Here, see what I mean in this very, very, very heavily edited version of their interview. You have not yet made an endorsement. Will you do it before the convention? I think Bernie should be in the White House. I think he should be President of the United States. All right. Sayonara.